Hey, I got a question for you. Is there something you really want to change in your life, but you haven't been able to get yourself to do it, no matter how hard you tried or how much willpower you tried to apply? Well, if that's true, you're going to enjoy this tape, because what I want to talk with you about is what I call the master system for creating change, the six fundamental and simple steps that anyone can take to immediately increase the quality of their life by changing anything you need to change and doing it now, not someday. Does that sound like a big promise? Well, it really isn't a big promise at all. After all, you've been changing things your whole life. The problem is most of us are making change without being conscious about how we're pulling it off. We don't notice what the difference is between when we make a change effectively and when we continue to struggle. I'd like to share with you in this tape those fundamentals. Now, first of all, before we even talk about making a change or how to do it, let's identify a couple of things. Number one, what kind of changes do you really want to make? And I would submit to you there are really only two changes you're ever really seeking in your life. You're either trying to change the way you feel about something or you're trying to change a behavior. Now, what does that mean? Well, what are the things you want to change how you feel about? Maybe you want to change the way you feel about yourself. Literally redefining yourself, expanding your view of who you are and what you're capable of. That's a change in how you feel. That's a change in your sense of certainty. Maybe you want to change the way you feel about something happened a long time ago in your life. Or maybe you want to change how you feel about the present or maybe even your future. Maybe you need to change the way you feel about a loved one or the loss of someone. All of these are simply changes in emotion. And they're things that we can do literally in a moment, but most of us don't. We feel imprisoned by patterns of our past where we feel chained to living and thinking in a way that we have done traditionally, even if it disempowers us. On the other side, many of us want to change our behaviors. Sure, we want to change. We want to stop overeating or drinking or smoking. We want to stop losing and getting angry at the drop of the hat. We want to stop being in a position where we feel like we have to operate in reaction, but instead be in control and be directing our own destinies. These two primary changes can be accomplished through the exact same system. We've identified the kinds of changes we want, but let's talk again and remind ourselves why do we do anything in the first place, much less change something. Why do we do anything? Why do we do what we're doing right now? Why are we doing those things that we want to change? And the answer is always this. Everything human beings do, they do either out of their need to avoid pain or their desire to gain pleasure. The challenge, of course, is that everyone in life has developed different strategies, different patterns for getting out of pain and into pleasure. For example, for some people have learned throughout their life the quickest way to get out of pain is to take a drug or to smoke or to drink. And so they use that pattern again and again and again. They don't just do it once in a while. They do it consistently. See, anyone can change something for the moment. The kind of change I want to talk to you about in this tape is long-lasting, consistent change. That only occurs if we change the pattern that we have developed for getting out of pain and into pleasure. Some people, by the way, get out of pain not just by using drugs or alcohol, but by doing other things more unique. Maybe they watch TV as a way to distract themselves and get out of the pain of boredom or frustration or anger or hurt or sadness or feeling alone. Other people go out and learn to sing. Some people learn the way to get out of pain is go read. Other people go skydive. Who you are today is being shaped by these patterns. And if you and I want to create permanent change, lasting change, consistent change, what we must do is develop a new set of patterns of how to get out of pain and into pleasure. Think about it. If you consistently feel a negative emotion, let's say, for example, it's overwhelm, you have a pattern of doing things that makes that happen, a pattern of focusing, for example. You keep picturing all the things you have to do all at one time, and you see it as being impossible to accomplish, and so immediately you feel overwhelmed. In order to feel overwhelmed, you have to do the same pattern again and again and again. All you would have to do to change this is interrupt the pattern. That is, stop the pattern that's going on and replace it with something that's more effective. Like, when you begin to feel this overwhelm, your new pattern becomes, ah, oh, let me focus on the most important thing that I can do right now that I know I'm in control of, and after I get done with that, then I'll look at the next thing. By developing this new pattern of chunking things down into simple, bite-sized steps, you won't be overwhelmed. Now, this sounds so simplistic. You say, well, then why don't I do it? Because there is a specific syntax of change. I can tell you myself, for more than a decade now, I've pursued the best technologies for creating change. What is a technology? It's a specific way of consistently producing a result. 
So I study things like gestalt therapy, neurolinguistic programming, Ericksonian hypnosis, and these were some of the cutting-edge technologies in the nation, ways to create change more rapidly than anything I'd ever seen before. I became so proficient at these skills that I was able to immediately start helping other people, and it became my life's work. I literally found that if I put myself on the line and I applied these technologies, there was very little I couldn't help people to change. And I got excited about it. I became an evangelist, basically. But there were those times when a change did not stick, where I'd made a shift with someone and I helped them to make a difference, but it didn't last. And it bugged me. Even though it was such a small percentage, it really drove me crazy, and it made me want to say, okay, what isn't working here? And gradually, I began to realize it wasn't the technology, it was the way it was being applied. And I also began to wonder, how come I'm so successful? I mean, after all, lots of other people know these same technologies. How come they're not getting the same results for people as I'm getting? And as I began to look even further, I said, well, look at all the people out there, all the therapists that are using all kinds of different approaches to helping people, and all of them work some of the time. The whole science of NEC, neuroassociative conditioning that I've developed, really came out of my asking two basic fundamental questions. My brain began to think, if all these different forms of therapy can help people to make changes and they can do it successfully, and all kinds do work, we have to agree, right? Everything from something as outrageous as primal screen therapy, rebirthing, to traditional Freudian approaches, non-directive approaches, rational emotive therapy. I mean, we could go on and on. They all work some of the time. So my question became, what do they have in common when they're all working? And secondly, what are they all missing when they fail to make the change? I mean, why is it that sometimes a person will walk in and see a therapist for one session or two or four or five and get the thing handled, and another they'll go for seven years? What is the difference? Because the truth is change happens in a moment like that. It doesn't take ten years to make a change. It literally happens in a moment, but the problem is that most of us in life take the seven years to get ourselves to the point where we finally make the decision to make the shift. So how do we make the change happen more quickly? And as I began to seek this out, several things became clear. The first thing I noted was that change only happens when we change what we link to a given situation in our nervous system, specifically when we change our neuro associations. In other words, as long as you're trying to diet, but dieting means pain to you, it is never going to last. The change is not going to be one that's long term. The only way that you can ever lose weight is if you pick those foods that right now you're addicted to, that are fatty or that are keeping you fat, that are polluting your system, and you learn to associate massive pain to them to the point you never even consider them again. If you link that much pain to them, you will not touch them again. But this cannot be an intellectual change. You probably know you shouldn't eat certain foods. You know they're fatty, but you still do it. <laughs> the reason you still do it is because you still link in your gut, in your neuro associations, that this food equals pleasure. So those shifts have to occur. And likewise, if a person has been through some horrible emotional event, they've been physically abused, they've been raped, the only way that that experience can be handled is if we change the sensations we link to it. That is, if that person was raped, as long as they feel helpless, as long as they feel tarnished by the experience, as long as they feel like the problem is permanent, and as long as the meaning is that their world is over, then they're going to be in pain. The only way to help this person to change is to change the meaning, change the sensations linked to it, so that now that situation becomes nothing but a powerful commitment that never again will this happen to this woman or this man or anybody else who they can have a chance to influence in a positive way. It becomes a drive. It becomes a positive set of sensations, even though it was a negative experience. This is the change that has to occur in human behavior, a change in what we link pain and pleasure to. So if it's really this simple, why don't we just change? Why don't we just do it right now? Good question. <laughs> Maybe it's time we started considering how we could do it. Let me offer you the best that I've learned analyzing all the therapies that I've done for people for the last 10 years, looking at the best therapists, the best change artists, if you will, that I've ever met in my lifetime, and looking at the times when it didn't work for those people, as well as looking at therapists that I thought were terrible, people who could not create a change in anybody. I have people coming back week after week after week and never seeing any real measurable progress. Out of it all, I've synthesized what I believe are the six master steps to creating any form of change. And let me clarify. 
These are the six giant steps you'll take, and you can use any form of technology. You can use something great like neurolinguistic programming. You can use gestalt therapy. You can use primal screen. You can use anything you want once you understand these six steps. You can put them within the six steps. In fact, as they start to go through these six, think right now, before we even begin, what is a change that you're committed to making happen once and for all? Something you've been putting off, something you haven't followed through on. And I'd say, go through the six steps. Take some notes. And if you're in the car, take them in your head and listen to this tape again and write down the notes and make sure these six steps are written in front of you somewhere and you begin to apply them in a very real and measured way. Here is step number one to changing anything in your life, whether it's an emotional pattern you want to shift or a behavior. And I have to warn you, it is so simple, it's a joke, but most people never do it. And it is the first step to change, and that is simply this. Decide what do you want and what's preventing you from getting it. Again, decide what is it that you really want and what's preventing you from getting it right now. Now, again, this sounds so third grade, doesn't it? But I can tell you, having worked with literally hundreds of thousands of people, that the first thing people focus on when they come to see you and they want you to make a change, whether it be in a seminar, one-on-one, -on -one, or any venue, they almost always come up and tell me what they don't want, not what they do want. I don't want to smoke anymore. I don't want to feel like hell anymore. I don't want to feel depressed. I want to change this. But rarely do they know exactly what they want to change to. When I say, what do you want to change to? They say, well, I don't know. I just want to feel better. That's too general. You and I have to remember our brain is the ultimate computer. If we give it precise instructions, it will fall through for us. But we've got to know exactly what we want, and that requires making a decision. Now, once again, most people in life have not used their decision muscles in so long that they got wimpy muscles. They have a hard time deciding what they're going to order for dinner, much less making a change. But you must start here. If you are not making progress and you're not achieving what you want, I can guarantee you there's an area you can enhance, and that is the clarity you have as to what it is you truly want. And are you clear on what's stopping you? And the answer you might say, well, I don't know what's stopping me. That's the problem. Yes, you do know. That false belief that you don't know what's holding you back is a belief system that keeps you from changing. From this day forward, I want to challenge you to operate from a brand new belief system. And that is you always know what's holding you back, and the minute you become aware of it, you can change it. And I can tell you in advance what it is. What's always holding you back is you're linking more pain at some level of your consciousness to changing than staying the way you are. At some level, you fear the change. Why? Because we human beings have this desperate need for certainty. Because when we're uncertain, which is making a change and tends to make us very uncertain, we get very fearful. Because the uncertainty means you might experience even more pain. See, that's a big challenge. And the only way that we're going to get ourselves to the point of really being able to accomplish what we want in our lives then is to develop such a clear idea of what we want that it's compelling, that it will drive us, that we'll have a new sense that if we make a change, we're going to have incredible pleasure in our lives. See, we don't want to change just to avoid the pain. We want to change so that we get more juice in our lives. So what is the change you want in your life? And then once you've decided what the change is, decide this. What do you want to change to? What do you really want? And, again, what's preventing you from getting it? It's either a belief or a negative feeling or association or a fear about what that change might bring, a sense of uncertainty. Think right now of something you want to change in your life, something that's very important to change, and get very clear on what do you want to change to. Instead of saying, I want to stop smoking, what do you want to do instead? Who do you want to be instead? How do you want to live instead? Define it very clearly. And then jot down what up until now, in fact, this might be a good way of wording this from now on, up until now, what has prevented you from taking the action necessary to make this change? Answer that question right now, stop the tape, and do step one. I assume that you went and did the exercise. I'm sure you're not continuing to listen to this without taking the time to do this, are you? Please take the time. Don't just listen passively. Otherwise, you'll be doing what you've always done in the past. Decide. Make a decision of how you want it to be. Now, for those of you who did the exercise, ignore the preceding announcement.
after you've gotten absolutely clear about what it is you really want, you know it's prevented you, now we go to step number two. And step number two is the number one reason why most people who try to help people to change fail or take years to make a change. Because, again, change happens in a moment. The key is getting ourselves to make that moment happen now. And the way we do that is through step number two, and that is get leverage on yourself. What do I mean by this? I mean you and I have to shift that basic pattern that keeps us from being able to change our lives. And that basic pattern is simply this. If you aren't changing anything, it's simply because you link more pain to changing than staying the way you are. Or you don't link enough pleasure to the idea of changing. It's not compelling enough. So we must gear up and accelerate the amount of pain we link to our present behavior or emotion, the one we want to change. We've got to make it so painful that change becomes an absolute must, not a should, not a could, not an ought to, an absolute must. Invariably, when I talk to people, they say things like, well, you know, I really should lose weight. I really should, you know, not be so abusive to my children verbally. I really should go out and try and start a new business. But see, you can sit there and shit all over yourself and nothing's ever going to change. You've got to make it a must. Now, how do you do that? Well, the first step is realizing, having the awareness that the only thing stopping you from changing is the fact that you honestly have mixed emotions about the whole idea. After all, you might think in your head, well, what if I go out there and I try to stop smoking and I actually quit and go through all the pain it would take to stop smoking and then I die of cancer anyway? gosh, I might go through all the pain and still have pain. Or what if I go out there and I really go on a diet and I still don't lose the weight? Or I gain it back? Why even try? It's too painful. Why even begin the process? These mixed emotions, these mixed neuro associations are what keep us from changing. We have to remember that the ability to change is not even a question. Your capability to change there's no doubt right now you could stop smoking. What do you got to do? Just not put that thing up to your lips. It's not like something that attacks you. You do it. If you're overweight, you're doing it to yourself. If you're getting angry all the time, you're doing it to yourself. If you're out of control in any area of your life, you're doing it to yourself, and you could change it right now, this moment, if you just decided to and cut off any other possibility. But most of us don't, and we don't because we don't realize that change is not a matter of capability. It's merely a matter of motivation. See, if I put a gun to your head and said, you better get out of that depressed state and start smiling and laughing right now and convince me that you've got a lot to live for, I'd be willing to bet that you probably would be able to respond and get yourself in a good state. Why? Because I'd have what you call massive leverage, where all of a sudden your brain would like, not changing is too painful. I've got to change quickly. We can always change. What we're missing is the leverage. If you go to see a therapist and you see them again and again and again and again on the same exact issue, why? Why? Why would you not make the change? Because you don't have enough leverage. Maybe you've even actually learned to appreciate the therapist and they're your friend. That's wonderful. But now what may be happening is you may have leverage to stay the way you are because after all, you want to continue to have this wonderful friend. We call this secondary gain where all of a sudden somebody may get injured, for example. In the beginning, getting well is really important. But when they got injured, something else happened. People around them really started expressing their love for them on a regular basis. They started doing things for them that they never did before. And all of a sudden, this person was receiving all this extra attention and this caring. Consciously, they want to get well, but unconsciously, their brain's saying, this is a pretty good deal. And so they have mixed emotions, and then the doctor can't figure out what's the matter with them. Why doesn't the body heal? Or it is healed, but they still seem to have the symptoms. Why? Because a lack of change always comes back to mixed neuroassociations. How do we change this? The answer is obvious. We must get ourselves to the point where we feel so excited, so turned on, so compelled about our new change, the thing we're going to change to, that we want it more than anything else on earth. And all we've got to do to do that is make it real. Find somebody who's living in a better way. Find somebody who has the kind of body that you want. Find somebody who can dance or move. Find somebody who's a role model, who inspires you, who's living the change that you want to have. That's the first element. And secondly, get yourself to link so much pain to not changing that you have to change right now. And you can do that by asking pain-associating questions. Questions like, what am I missing out on right now in my life because I haven't made this change? What have I already missed out on? And then as you begin to get associated to those feelings, when you begin to get yourself to a point where your brain says, I've had it, never again. It's in that moment that your life changes. 
And that is your step two. Let's do it right now. That very same change you want to make. And the thing that was preventing you, you've got a link now. Stop and think about the pain, what you've missed out on, what you've ripped yourself off of by not following through, the pain you'll have in the future if you don't change, the pain you have presently. You've got to make it urgent to change, not someday, but right now, and make it real. And then when you're done with that, you've got to think about if you change, what will you get instead? What will be the pleasure? And make that real. Visualize it. Imagine it. Make it so compelling. Take a moment. Do it with pencil and paper if you can right now. And then begin to focus in your mind until you clearly know that change is a must. Again, I hope you're doing this exercise right now. You're not just playing the tape. Okay, welcome back. So we've done step one. What is it? We're absolutely clear on what we really want. Not just what we want to change, but what do we really want in our lives and what's prevented us up until now to make that change. Two, we now have massive leverage. We know that we can't go another day. We've hit emotional threshold. Not one more day living this way. Not one more day with this behavior. Not one more day of feeling depressed. Not one more day of whatever it is you want to change. And we know how compelling and exciting it's going to be to live life with the new change. Well, let me tell you something. I hope you remember this the rest of your life. 80% of making a change is having a strong enough why. 20% is knowing how to do it. How is easy. There's so many ways to change. It's a joke. But you've got to get enough reasons, compelling reasons. That's the leverage. Now, if we know what we want, if we got ourselves in a position where we got massive leverage, we still could have a problem. And the problem is there are a lot of people out there that know what they want, and they're driven. They've got to change. But they keep doing the same things again and again and again and again. You know, there was a definition of insanity that was given years ago, and the definition was doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different result. I'm sure you've seen a fly on a window trying to get out. You know, it searches for a way out of the room, and it heads in the direction of the light. Well, sure enough, it hits the glass. What does it do? It hits it again, hits it again, hits it again. Some flies never figure it out. They just keep doing the same things, and they end up dying in the room. The only way you can change, even with all your motivation and drive, is you must do step number three. You must interrupt your old pattern. You must interrupt the pattern that is holding you back, whatever it is. I don't care if it's the pattern of every time you're stressed reaching for food or reaching for a cigarette or alcohol, or if it's the pattern of yelling at people because you feel frustrated inside. You must interrupt it just for the moment. You don't even have to stop it, but you've got to interrupt it. Because when we interrupt the pattern, we render it useless. We don't want to keep on doing the same thing where now you must change, but you keep going out there and trying the same approach over and over and over again. It's not going to work. It's like the guy that goes out looking for his keys. He lost his keys. He doesn't know where they are. Have you ever done this? And you go running around, and you check in this one drawer. You check the whole drawer. They're not there. Then you go to the next spot in the room. Then the next. Then you go back out to the car. You check the floor of the car. You check the seats. You check the ignition. You come back in the house, and you've checked everywhere you can think. So what do you do? You go back and check the drawer again. How crazy. What do you think is going to happen? It's suddenly going to appear in the drawer? See, it makes no sense to do the same things over and over and over again and expect a different result. We've got to interrupt the pattern. And you know what? There's so many easy ways to do it. Interrupting a pattern merely requires you do something out of the ordinary. You do something unexpected to yourself or to the person you're trying to break the pattern of. See, I'll give you an example. Have you ever been in a situation where you're so caught up in a conversation it's like super important to you are totally immersed? And then somebody comes by over here from the right-hand side of you and asks you the stupid question that has nothing to do with anything you're talking about. And you go, what? What are you talking about? And you, you have to think for a minute to answer their question because it makes no sense to you. And you finally answer their question. You get it all settled. You come back to your conversation. And what happened? You can't even remember what you were talking about, even though it was important to you. See, that's a classic example of having your pattern interrupted. And you know what? The same thing happens with our emotions. We can be in a really lousy state, maybe be in a fight with somebody, but have them all of a sudden do something that cracks us up. Have you ever had that experience? Now, I know it doesn't happen all the time because you're usually so caught up in your pattern. But if something weird, outrageous, or funny enough happens, you ever been caught up in an argument and then all of a sudden you guys say something to each other and one of you starts to crack up, it destroys the whole thing. You can't stay mad. Same thing happens with depression. Same thing happens with virtually every area of our lives. The problem is that very rarely do these things happen because we are not deliberate in our approach to breaking patterns. By the way, the metaphor I've shared with people for years about breaking patterns is very simply this. If you're depressed, 
you have to run a certain pattern. You have to put your shoulders in a certain way, open them down. You've got to put your eyes down. You've got to breathe a certain way. You've got to picture in your mind the worst possible scenarios that you think have happened or will happen in the future. You've got to talk to yourself in a lousy way. That requires a lot of work. It's not easy. And it's a pattern you've developed. But if in the middle of doing that, all of a sudden you break the pattern, you interrupt it by suddenly grinning from ear to ear, breathing fully, if you do anything to break that pattern, anything weird or outrageous or even stupid, you will absolutely change your state. What happens if you put your shoulders back up? You breathe. You put a big, stupid, silly grin on your face. You raise your hands above your head and clap them together and say, thank God my feet don't stink today. Or some other stupid thing, as ridiculous and inane as this sounds. It works because it breaks your pattern. Now, it only works for a moment. And I understand that, but that's only step three, remember. We've got six steps here. We've got to interrupt the pattern. And if we keep interrupting it, though, if you keep taking a record, which is nothing but a pattern, think of it. If we took out a compact disc or a record, the only reason you hear that same music, get those same feelings, is because there's a pattern in that record. But if I take that record out one day and I take that needle and I go across that record back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and I keep breaking all those patterns, Pretty soon, if I do that enough times, that record will never play the same way again. Now, if I only put one scratch across it, it'll just skip a beat, but the basic pattern is still there. So if we want to change our behavior, we've got to know what do we want, what's preventing us. We've got to get leverage where we must change, and then we've got to interrupt the pattern and do it many different times. We can do it with what we call a visual scramble technique. Many of you are familiar with this. That's where you imagine something. Something that's been bugging you. But remember, you first got clear what you want instead. You know you're committed to changing. Then what do you do? You close your eyes. Try it now as long as you're not driving. Think of something that you really are committed to changing. Think of some element of that. Something you really want instead. What do you want to change to? Make sure you know that you're committed to changing this now. All of your being, there's no part of you that has mixed emotions. And then all you've got to do now is imagine that situation, that memory you have some negative feelings towards whatever it was, and just see it like a normal movie. And then what? Simply run it backwards as fast as you can to the beginning. Then run it forwards, then backwards, then forwards, then backwards. If people were saying things that bothered you, make their nose big like Pinocchio, make their ears big like Dumbo, play some weird cartoon music, run it forwards and backwards. You know this technique, don't you? Run it back and forth, back and forth, at least 20 times. Every time, change the colors of everything in there. Put rainbow colors in everybody's faces. Make it the most bizarre and weird cartoon and scramble it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What you're doing is you're taking this memory and you're scratching it up a million different ways. If you do it faster and faster, the key here is speed. The key is to put a big grin on your face while you're doing it. If you're not smiling, put a smile on your face. Make it weird. Make it bizarre. Scramble the sensations. Again, 20, 25 times of this, you will not feel the same way again. You will not get back in that angry state. You will not get back in that depressed state if you do it strongly enough. Now realize the scramble is only one way to break a pattern. If you find yourself consistently doing something like overeating, and your way of trying to change this is to say, well, I better stop doing this because it makes me feel bad, and I know I shouldn't do this because then I get fat. That's not going to do it. Your brain's going to go, give me the food, because you link too much pleasure to that food. You want to do it, you've got to do something outrageous. You've got to break the pattern. Next time you find yourself overeating and you're in a public restaurant, jump up out of your seat, point down at your own chair and scream, Pig! And I promise you, if you do that two or three times in a public place, you'll never do it again. You won't overeat. I say this only with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek. The point is, the more outrageous your pattern up, the more effective it will be. But we've got to break the pattern. So now that we've gone through step three, you've got to interrupt your pattern. The question is, how? And remember, the best way to interrupt a pattern is to be outrageous, to do something a person does not expect, to do something that really radically changes your own state. So what I want you to do is stop the tape and write down a bunch of bizarre ideas. Come up with at least ten brainstorm ideas on how to break the pattern of feeling depressed that you had or being angry or feeling overwhelmed. What could you picture when you start to feel overwhelmed that would crack you up? What could you say to yourself? What could you do with your body? What could you do if you're in a position of overeating or drinking or smoking to interrupt the pattern in a humorous way, a funny way, something that would jar you out of that pattern and maybe even make you smile or make you laugh? Turn off the tape right now. I know you don't know all the answers, but write down the best ones you can come up with right now. Great. Welcome back. Now, on the list you come up with, what are the top three best ways to break your pattern? Circle those and make sure you use them. And by the way, if you're not satisfied with the ways you've come up with for, to break those patterns, 
find somebody who is now no longer overeating, no longer drinking, no longer getting depressed, and find out what do they do instead, and find out how did they break their pattern, and use the same tool. Once you interrupt the pattern, though, your job is not done. This is one of the biggest mistakes that people make. Some people actually get to the point of interrupting their pattern. They stop the smoking. They stop the overeating pattern for a short period of time, but that's a critical moment. Now that you've broken the pattern, you've got to move in with step number four, and that is create an empowering alternative. We must preserve the intention of our old behavior. The reason you smoked was not to kill yourself. You smoked because it gave you something. It gave you a way to get out of boredom, or it gave you something to do with your hands, or it gave you a way to relax because when you smoked, you took deep breaths slowly, or it gave, you used it to give yourself a reward or as an excuse to get out of the room. You need to find a new pattern that will give you the same benefits without the negative side effects. This is a must to having long-term change. Okay. Let's do step number four together. What's the alternative now? If you're not going to get upset and angry, if you're not going to get depressed, if you're not going to overeat, you're not going to drink, what are you going to do instead to change your emotional states? Sit down and brainstorm a whole series of ways that you can get yourself out of pain and into feeling good right now. Something you could do anywhere. Take a moment now and make your list. Welcome back again. I hope you enjoy your list. Now, what you should do is carry it with you and practice it. Make it like a menu. So from now on, when you don't feel good, pull out your menu and say, okay, here are all the ways I can make myself feel good instead of the old ways I used to do that were destructive. And again, find a role model. If you don't like your ways, find somebody else who does something instead of drinking or smoking. And find out what do they do instead to make themselves feel good. Use their techniques. Remember the power of role modeling. Let's go on to step number five. And that is you must now condition your new pattern until it remains consistent. Conditioning is the key. As long as we're using willpower to try and enforce a new pattern, it's not going to last. We've got to condition ourselves so that now that we have this new pattern, this new way to feel good, we've got to make sure that our brain always goes there. I mean, the best example I can give you is, I know recently I was really busy, and I tend when I'm at home to get on the freeway going towards San Diego, because that's the direction I had about 90% of the time. Well, I was caught up on the phone in a conversation. I needed to go a different direction. But I'm so conditioned to go to San Diego that unconsciously I got on the freeway, and I was down about a mile before I realized what I'd done. Have you ever been in that place? That's classic conditioning. You've got to remember that whatever we focus on again and again in our mind, whatever we reinforce, will eventually become conditioned within us. Conditioning is basic. Do something over and over and over again with enough emotional intensity and feeling, and it will become conditioned. So you and I need to remember that if we rehearse something over and over again, we're laying the neurological connections in our mind each time we do it. Our mind cannot tell the difference between something we vividly imagine and something we actually experience. Remember, every time you use your new pattern, you will be reinforcing this new neurological connection in your mind, and pretty soon this will be the dominant pattern of your life. Pretty soon when you get on the freeway of your emotion, you'll only go in one direction, and that's the positive direction. Right now, write down a couple things you can do to make sure that you stick to this new alternative, that it becomes conditioned. Let's go to final step number six. With these first five steps, what will you have accomplished? You will have interrupted a pattern that didn't work, and you will have replaced it with a new empowering pattern and conditioned it so that now you feel certain it's going to work. But how are you going to know for sure? The answer is, step six, you've got to test it. And the best way to test it is use a technique that they taught in neurolinguistics, and that's called a future pace. That's where you just sit down, you close your eyes, and you imagine that situation where you wanted to make the change, where you think you have made a change, and you notice how you react. For example, if one of the changes you want to make was not feeling rejected, if in the past every time your boss raised their voice you felt destroyed, all you got to do now to see if it works is test it. Close your eyes and imagine your boss being intense with you and notice how you feel. Do you feel resourceful? Do you feel the way you've conditioned yourself or do you feel the old way? If you feel the old way, you've got to recycle. Either you haven't conditioned things enough or your empowering alternative is not strong enough or you didn't really break the pattern or you don't have enough leverage or you're not really clear on what you want. Just recycle the six steps until you produce the result you're committed to. And part of testing is making sure that if you make this change, that it's going to be ecological. The study of ecology really is the study of consequences. So what you've really got to do is just think, look back. You need to ask yourself, by making this change, will my whole life be enhanced? Will any area of my life be disturbed by this change? Will it hurt my career or help it? 
And as long as you note that the changes you're making are consistent with your own personal values and they support the people around you, then your test will be complete. You can live by this new pattern and you have created the change that you've been pursuing. So go out in the next 30 days and have a ball. Change anything you want to change. Anything you don't like, change it. Make your world the way you want it. Remember, you have the power to shape your destiny. Take control now. And most importantly, have fun. Enjoy the process of making change. The biggest mistake people make is they think change has to be painful. If you break your own patterns in fun ways, you can make the next 30 days the most enjoyable changes you've ever made. Right now, there's a pattern of change that's occurring throughout the industrialized world that doesn't get much press. We're just starting to see it in our newspapers and our magazines. But it's a pattern. It's a distinction. It's a change that's going to affect every aspect of your personal and professional life. And if we fail to anticipate this change, we're going to experience pain. And if we do anticipate it, we can take advantage. We can have an edge. We can create a greater quality of life than we ever have before. This pattern of change, you wonder what it is. Well, I'm not going to tell you just yet. You've got to think as usual and stay with me a little bit here. I will tell you this, though. This simple pattern of change that's happening throughout the industrialized world, and I want to talk with you about, there is a danger that when I talk with you about it, that you'll see it as something that's happening to someone else, that you'll see it as being something that has nothing to do with your personal life because, you know, after all, nothing like this has ever happened to you in the past. If there's one thing that you and I have to know about the 21st century, it's that it will be nothing like the 20th century. That what has been is not what will be. That the process of change, as we know it, has changed radically. We've always had change. But what we're well aware of now, and it's almost a cliche to even say it, is that what's different about change today is it's happening more rapidly than ever before, but also changes are happening in a discontinuous fashion. Meaning, we used to have continuous change. You could say, well, things are going to get better. You know, we know what change is going to be. We may not know the details, but we know that the next generation is going to be better off than this generation. We know that whatever we're doing here in our business, we're just going to do it better next year. Well, that's not necessarily true anymore. Change today can happen instantaneously in a way that we cannot anticipate, or at least have not anticipated before, where suddenly we're not doing it better. We're doing something completely different at this company. Overnight, when you have something like the Soviet Union disappear, when a wall comes down in Germany, when suddenly corporations like IBM will come out and say, we're going to lay off 150,000 workers in less than two years, a company that always promised permanent employment and has been known as the international company of example, when all these things happen that rapidly, literally overnight, these are not continuous change. These are not changes we would anticipate. These are discontinuous change. So what I'm trying to say to you is before I talk to you about this simple pattern, this affects you personally. This is going to affect you. If it isn't doing affecting you now, it's going to affect you in the near future. It will affect you whether you own your own company, whether you're an executive for a corporation, whether you're just entering the workforce, or if you're never even planning on working and you're a homemaker because it's going to affect the structure of how your family even functions. So what the heck am I talking about here? What I'm speaking to you about is the radical changes that we're seeing in the structure of work in industrialized societies. What the heck does that mean? Well, you and I have lived with a certain set of assumptions, at least most of us in industrialized countries have, up until now. And that was that, hey, half of your life, basically, your adult life, you were going to drive someplace, you were going to go to work at that location. If you really did work hard and you really added value, you would continue to work for that company unless you chose to leave. And if the company got into trouble, at the very worst, you would have experience at this corporation that would be marketable to go to work for somebody else. And sure enough, you planned your life based around that. Because the structure of how we work determines dinner times, determines when you're going to see your children. It determines to a great extent how you think about your future, what you think is possible, what you think is impossible. So what's changed? You say, I'm still going to the same job. I'm still doing the same thing. Well, one thing that's changed is the future. Ask any baby buster, those young people now coming out of college, who've gone and lived by the rules. What have they done? They went out and they got the education, right? Maybe a great education, spent a fortune to get the education, invested their lives, their time, their energy. They're having a hard time getting a job. They don't understand. Just a few years ago, if you did all these right things, you could get a great job with a great corporation. 
right? If you studied to get an MBA, you certainly would get a job on Wall Street. Wall Street was coming up and courting these young men and women. It's not happening in that environment or virtually any other environment. We're finding young people who are incredibly well-educated who are going to work in retail outlets as salespeople for minimum wage. It's an amazing environment. I'm sure you're seeing it around where you are. You might say, well, I don't care. I'm not a baby buster. Well, you should care because they're a major part of our society. Many of them are getting there 28, 29, almost 30 years old, and they still haven't found, many of them, what their career is, what their compelling future is, where they can invest themselves, their resources, their imagination, their creativity. They want to enhance our society. Instead, many are getting frustrated and overwhelmed. Not all, but many. And by the way, it's no different for you if you are a baby boomer. The only difference is you were around earlier when there was a boom going on. You were around when our society was a bit different, and you got probably a great job, a great career. But you may have a bit of concern about this thing called downsizing, or right-sizing as they now call it. Why aren't these jobs available? Because in the last 10 years, the latest statistics show we've lost almost 4 million jobs in less than 10 years. What's happening is these companies, in an effort to try and compete are changing the structure of corporations and therefore the number of jobs and the types of jobs that are available. This is changing the way people think about their future. It even changes the way some people look at their present. You say, well, you know, but this is a temporary thing. You know, things are tight right now. No, they're not. They're booming. Things are booming right now. Corporations, many of them are growing and expanding. New industries are starting up. Some people say, well, when is it going to return to normal? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is normal. This is the new status quo, continuous change with corporations and organizations trying to reorganize so they can compete more intensely in a world market. And the impact of their decision-making is changing the structure of work. You say, what do you mean by the structure of work? So far, you just talked about unemployment. Well, here's what's really changing. Companies are beginning to realize that the structure of a company, and if you're an executive, you certainly know this and are probably already addressing it, that you want to have a company that is flexible, that can change quickly and radically to meet the changing desires, modes, and needs of today's consumer, and a company that's competing on a world scale. In order to do that, they're trying to make sure they have the smallest amount of cost, and they started something called outsourcing. What's outsourcing? They're saying, why should we do our own accounting? Let's have an outside firm do that. Why should we employ somebody to stock all of our materials? Let's have the company that's selling us this stuff keep things in stock and manage it. And as a result, you're seeing these big corporations shrinking, and lots of small businesses are starting up, many small businesses. In fact, during the 1980s, we saw a huge shrinkage in Fortune 500 America. But what we saw grow faster than anything in history is women-owned businesses, small entrepreneurship started by women. Now, what does that mean? Why is this happening, and what is the impact upon your life? Well, the first thing it does, it destabilizes the one area of your life most people take for granted. We have all these assumptions. Well, I know what work is, and I know how I'm going to work, and I know how it's going to happen, and I'm going to have this one employer. No, you're going to have multiple employers, most people. In fact, for most countries, it now appears if the momentum continues in the direction it's going, and there's no reason for it not to, as you'll see in a moment, as I explain to you what the force is that's causing this change. But if it continues to move in this direction, approximately half of our population will be living outside what we currently call the norm of employment, called full-time employment. Half the people will be part of outsourcing. Half the people will have part-time employment or multiple employers. That's an amazing change. Think about what that will do to your family life. Think about what that does to your time. Think about what that does to your sense of certainty about the future. Think about what that demands from you in terms of your ability to create quality so you can continue to have the same customer as an employer. Pretty soon your employer becomes your customer if you work for someone else in any way, shape, or form. And if you have your own business, it means you're looking at running your business differently. Well, you're more flexible. Well, you can hire somebody for the short term and then let them go as you make a change in the way you run your business without upsetting anyone, without creating a bunch of economic challenges, giving you the flexibility and power to meet the marketplace. Now, what is causing this change? Why are so many people now part-time employed? Is it because there just aren't the jobs? No, that's not the reason. The reason is we're running into three or four new factors that are part of our world society that are causing businesses to make changes. The first one is technology. 
Recall we already said that change has always occurred, but it's happening more rapidly now than ever before. And a major source of the speed of change is technology. Because number one, it's changing the way companies operate because corporations are finding that through new machines, new technology, new innovations, they can now get the same job done or a better job done with no human beings. They can eliminate dozens or sometimes hundreds of jobs. This has happened for major corporations in their accounting departments. Just imagine a bank that had multiple outlets and the hundreds of accountants they used to have versus the dozens that they now have to get the same job done where any executive can get the information they need at their fingertips at almost the speed of light. This has also happened in industries as simple as farming. We used to have 30 million farmers in this country who helped us to feed 100 million people. That was at the turn of the century. Today, we have 1% of those farmers. We have 300,000 farmers in the entire nation, and they feed 300 million people because of technology. Not only everybody in this nation, but we feed people overseas as well. So technology is changing the pace of change, and it's making businesses have to change more rapidly. Because if your competition begins to get this kind of technology, he or she can leave you in the dust. So all of a sudden, you can't be like Henry Ford, where he made one product, and the life cycle of that product was a generation. The Model T was sold to a generation. Today, the product life cycle of any product has shrunk down to as little as six months to a year and a half. Many companies create products now knowing that it's only going to last in the marketplace for as little as six to nine months. Can you imagine? Now, if that's true of a product, you can imagine what that means to jobs. If we're only going to make that product for that period of time, unless the person in the job has multiple skills, we're going to have to find somebody else to do what we're going to make now or what we're going to sell now or what we're going to market now. This technology is changing the way businesses operate. And the other factor is technology is changing the way we work because we no longer have to go to one central place to work. Technology now allows people to live virtually wherever they want and do much of their business because much of the business of the information society is manipulating ideas or words or sounds or images on computers or other forms of systems or it's negotiations, it's communication through telephones. We're in a situation today between computers and faxes and modems. We're in a position where many people can choose to live virtually anywhere and it totally changes their idea of the workplace, the work environment, where they can do business, how many countries they can do business in, which brings up the next major factor that's affecting the pace of change and therefore your work life and that is competition. Because of technology, we truly have a competitive world because people now from virtually anywhere in the world can interact. They can do business. They can make offers. They can come up with concepts. They can synergize between one another. This is creating a world where there are so many people participating and producing products and services that there's been a huge change in the balance between supply and demand. I mean, think about it. This generation has learned a different lesson than previous generations about buying products and services, and they're affecting the workplace. This generation has learned that there is no scarcity of products, that there are lots of products out there, that if you want a fax machine, there are multiple numbers of fax machines out there that you can kind of pick and choose what you want. There is so much competition out there that it's making every business have to work harder to be more profitable. They have to add more value for less money. And as a result, that's why many of them have turned to downsizing or resizing to try and figure out how to compete. But downsizing and resizing is not the answer, as we're going to find out here. The third factor that's going to shape the way businesses are conducted and therefore the structure of your future work is demographics and psychographics. What the heck does that mean? Well, if an economy is driven by consumers... And what consumers spend money on determines where businesses put their attention, who gets employed and who doesn't. Then we have to look at who are the major consumers of our economy. In fact, who is the major person shaping our society? Well, there was a generation that has controlled and directed our society for years, and they were the major purchaser of products and services up until fairly recently. And that generation was a World War II generation. Now, if you look at this generation, they went through a depression where they felt like they had almost nothing, scarcity, and then they went through a war. And by the way, when somebody said, hey, we're going to go to war, they didn't say, why? They reported immediately. Johnny come marching home type of an attitude, right, from a previous war, and they went right out immediately, and they knew the world was black and white. It was clear who was the good guy, who was the bad guy. And if you played by the rules and you respected authority and did the right thing, you'd come back a hero, and they did. And these people, when they came back and they finally wanted to have some pleasure, they wanted a better quality of life, 
Some of the technology created options, and new technology provided ways for them to have a better life with less pain. And they moved to things called suburbs, a new development, and they wanted to purchase items, things like refrigerators. And in those days, getting a refrigerator was an exciting thing. Getting a television was an exciting thing. Think about that process. They wanted their kids to grow up and have all this great pleasure. And so they raised their children with a different set of values in some cases, in many cases. They taught their kid a different lesson. They taught their kid that you're special. You're unique. You know what? I want you to be happy. Your happiness is the most important thing. If they didn't say it verbally, they said it by their actions. If a young person from World War II generation broke the rules, they knew they were going to get pain for it. But if this baby boom generation, the generation that came out of this group, the generation that's now starting to be the largest consumer base in the history of Western civilization, this mass number of births that came from these people came back from World War II. They wanted pleasure. They had kids. These kids learned not to go out there and work seven days a week and work really hard. They didn't learn to take care of everybody else first. What many of them learned was your happiness is the most important thing in life. I want you to be happy. I want you to have a better life than I'm happy. You're going to be more intelligent. You're going to go to school. You're going to get an education. These people grew up with a different environment, and they learned that breaking the rules could be fun. Because after all, guys like Dr. Spock entered in and said, hey, if your kid breaks the rules, you've got to let him kind of explore and discover himself. A little different society began to be shaped. And what happened is we developed a culture of people that learned to break the rules and learned it could actually be enjoyable to break the rules. You might create an identity by breaking the rules. These people, when drugs were available, and they, of course, didn't know the consequences, of course they'd be willing to use a drug. Why wouldn't you? It's a way to be happy, one of the things they were programmed to do. If they did go to war, did they have a real clear idea of why they were there? Was there clear authority? Was it clear who the good guy was and who the bad guy was? The answer is no. These people went into an environment where they were not clear at all, where they might be sitting in a rice paddy next to a guy smoking a joint, where they weren't sure why they were even there. They had not been raised to have an ideology that was singular and focused. And sure enough, one day, let's say somebody's out there and he likes children, and he's there with his buddy doing a patrol, and he finds this little boy, he starts talking to him. Of course, he can't speak his language, but he thinks he's cute, and he turns around to walk away, and the little boy pulls out a machine gun and blows away his best friend. And in an effort to save his own life, he turns and pulls his machine gun and blows the young child away. What do you think that does to a generation? What did it do to you if you were part of that generation? And by the way, when these people finally did come home, did they win? Did they have parades celebrating? No, they were called baby killers. Many people spit on them. What do you think that did to them? While they're gone, their heroes were killed. A Kennedy, a king. The President of the United States said that he was leaving office, but he was not a crook. This was a bit confusing for a few people. What did this generation learn? What many people in this generation learned was loyalty to anything can get you killed for no good reason. In fact, some songs with similar verses actually became very popular. Think about it. How does this affect today's society? Well, the leading edge of this group of people we now call baby boomers are taking over our culture. Number one, they have a bit of money to spend. They're now at the leading edge, 48 years old. At the lower end, they're around 32, 33, 34 years old. These people have begun to succeed. They have capital, and they're going to make a decision, but they don't make it the same way as past consumers. Number one, they know there's unlimited supply. They've learned that they can have whatever they want, and they don't just want a product. They want a product that meets their individual needs. They want a product with their name on it. World War II generation had three flavors of ice cream, strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla. How many are there now? God only knows. Right? Ben and Jerry showed up. This generation wants ice cream with their signature on it, their own personal one, to meet their own personal needs. They want to buy from somebody who knows that they're special and unique. Anyone who shows them that they care about them at that level, who knows they're special and unique, just like mommy and daddy taught them, is going to get their attention. But also, you got to remember, this person is choosy and jaded. They don't have to have it. Anybody who wants a refrigerator now, anybody who wants a VCR within reason, has already got it. So now they don't have to buy. They're not driven by scarcity. They're very, very choosy. You've got to give them everything. They've learned by Japanese competition that they can not only have, let's say, the best quality, but they can also have the best price in the same item and have selection and have service. That's now the norm. Now this group of people expect everything. And as a result, since you can't get them to buy unless you meet their needs, and their needs are so much higher, businesses cannot operate the same way they used to. So now they have to be so flexible because these people's idea of what they want can change very quickly. 
And by the way, as a result of these demographic and psychographic changes, changes in psychology, changes in who's actually purchasing what, we're also finding companies like Sears are having difficulty. You know why? Because these people won't buy from Sears just because they always have. They're not loyal to a company. They're not loyal to a name. Many brand names are wondering, how are we going to compete? Why are we losing some consumers? It's because this new consumer... And by the way, this new consumer is starting to run these multinational companies. This new consumer is somebody whose needs are much different than anybody you've ever met before. In addition, our entire society is changing because this new consumer is also the person running the nation. The President of the United States now is a baby boomer, as is the vice president. Think about it. Heads of multinational corporations now are baby boomers. Who are baby boomers? They are rule breakers. They're not willing to do things just because it was always done that way. Oftentimes they like change. They want change to happen. We promised full-time employment. That was then. This is now. Today to compete, we've got to change it all. They've changed the economy wherever they've gone. There's a good metaphor for them. It's like a giant pig going through a snake. You know, when, when baby boomers were all born, guess what happened? Diaper sales went crazy because of this huge number of people who needed diapers. When all of a sudden they went to school, we needed more schools. When all of a sudden they'd grown up and went into business, in the financial markets, there's a stimulation in that area. See, we can pretty much track a great deal of our economy, a great deal of where we're going to, baby boomers. All of this background is to help you to understand where our culture is going. See, if we have to wait until change happens to you, you're on the back end of change, and you're going to have some pain. But if we can anticipate it, we can see where things are going, we can begin to take advantage. So what all this is causing to occur is we've got a situation now where we have a very choosy consumer who now requires a tremendous amount. They want every bit of value they've ever gotten and then some. They want things to always be better, and they want them to be cheaper, and they want service, and they want supply, and that's what they expect that they're not going to buy. So what's happening in companies? What companies are doing is saying, man, we've got to cut our costs so we can compete. And so what they're doing is they're eliminating a lot of jobs. The problem is less than 50% of the companies that have downsized in the last two years are any more profitable today than before they downsized. So we have not solved the problem just by eliminating jobs, by cutting the waste, because there are many other things that have to be done. So what some companies, of course, have turned to is the past. They said, well, we need to turn to total quality management. It's a great set of tools, but it doesn't help you to innovate as rapidly as the market now demands. So gradually, there are a few companies that have figured out how to succeed, and they are the model by which other companies are now beginning to create change. Their model is not one of continuous improvement. Their model is how do we make radical changes in the way in which we actually conduct our business so that we make dramatic improvements in what we can give the consumer and dramatic improvements in our profitability simultaneously. Now, a couple of business experts by the names of Michael Hammer and James Champy gave a term to what these companies were doing. It's called re-engineering. In its technical term, it's called business process re-engineering. Big term. You go, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear this. I don't need to re-engineer a business. I'm not even into engineering. Well, you might want to re-engineer your life when you understand what it really is. It's a way to dramatically improve the quality of your life by basically asking some new questions. Aren't there areas of your personal life that could be re-engineered? Aren't there areas where you're doing things that really don't make total sense? Or maybe it makes total sense based on the past. But if you were to totally rethink things, isn't there a more efficient way of doing things, a more enjoyable way of doing things? We all have systems we're not even aware of, just out of habituation. Like, for example, the way you get up in the morning and how you get prepared and what you do. Maybe instead of going to the cleaners twice a week and traveling there and spending time in line and finding a parking place and coming out, you get a cleaner that picks up your clothes and delivers them back at home. You don't even have to think about the process. Again, that's awfully simplistic. But you know something? We interviewed a gentleman by the name of Rick Newland. Some of you are familiar with him. He's a young man who jumped into a wave one day as a surfer in Orange County, and he hit the wave wrong, and it snapped his spine. He became a quadriplegic instantaneously, and no one was sure he would live. But through a process of not just reengineering, but what I would again call regeneration, he has reorganized the way he lives his life in a way that gives him immense pleasure and allows him to do most of the things he used to do, but in a brand new way, causing him to use different resources to get the job done. He's an amazing man. But the bottom line is there was something he said I thought was interesting. He said, you know, I think that most people know how to deal with the walls in life, smacking against the wall. 
He said it's the pebbles that really screw our life up. The things that kind of knock you out of state, that the little things that just drive you crazy, and then all of a sudden you snap at your spouse, or, or you, you give up, or you get burnt out and tired and don't give a thousand percent of your effort. So those little things are what really screw us up. So part of reengineering also in your personal life might be how do I get rid of as many pebbles as possible? How do I reengineer my home life, etc.? And the only thing I thought of after I started really studying reengineering in more detail was it became obvious from all the statistics that have been collected that between 50 and 70 percent of all the companies that begin a reengineering process fail. That is, the reengineering process does not succeed. Now, after all this buildup I've given up to reengineering, you say, oh, my gosh, what's the matter here? And, that, and that's according, by the way, to Michael Hammer and James Champy, the guys who came up with this whole term and have really studied the process and it's probably as much detail as anyone. And as I looked at that, I said, okay, why is it failing? And I realized that reengineering is only part of the process of creating a dramatic and lasting change in an organization, in a business, or even a person's personal life. So I started thinking about all that I know about change and all that I was studying, and I began to create a different concept, and a concept I now call regeneration. Now, what the heck is regeneration? Well, by definition, regeneration for me is the process of using human ingenuity to transform dormant resources. Dormant meaning something you're just not currently using. I don't care if it's a skill or an understanding or an ability you have. If it's a corporation, it might be people you're not using. It might be resources, computers are not being fully utilized. I don't care what it is, but it's a transforming dormant resources into significant assets that powerfully increase the quality of our lives. What regeneration really is, is how do you use the resources you already have to create something new, something greater, something better than ever existed before? It's like how do we produce a rebirth in our lives, a rebirth in a company? That's what regeneration meant to me. So I looked at that and I said, okay, what are we capable of as human beings when we really tap into our creativity, into our ingenuity? Unbelievable things. See, what gives things value in the 21st century is human creativity. It's brain power. See, brain power gives you the ability to add the most value to any natural resource. Listen, we learned how to turn dirt into a $150 billion a year industry, right? Computers. We turn sand into silicon chips to store information, to transfer information that has changed the structure of work. That came out of human creativity, ingenuity, somebody who was willing to throw away all the old belief systems. Because to build these things, to build these computers, to build computer chips, they had to believe the opposite of what everybody believed before them. They had to re-engineer their thoughts. They had to regenerate. They had to say, you know what? Better is cheaper. <laughs> that was never thought of before. They had to say, you know what? When things move faster, they're going to get cooler. These are core beliefs that were necessary to have these breakthroughs happen in the computer industry. This fries most people's brains. But see, this is how change happens. And you and I, every single person that you're going to meet has this well of creativity inside them, but it hasn't been tapped before because it hasn't had to be tapped. Because human beings only tap into real ability when things are a must, not a should. And for most people, change has been a should. But I'm here to tell you, here is what's exciting. Here's the payoff of this tape. We are living in a society now where the demands are so much higher on business that we have to get more creative than ever before, and that is every person's niche who's willing to develop themselves, train themselves, to use their mind and body in brand new ways, to add more value. How do we regenerate the quality of life by tapping into those unused resources and turning them into assets that improve the quality of not only our lives, but other people's as well? Let's come back to reengineering just for a second, though. You say, what's the difference between regeneration and reengineering? Well, reengineering is one of five steps that help you to regenerate, that is to create a new, to produce a lasting, massive, dramatic change in your life, in an organization, in a community, in a family, in a country. Now, why hasn't reengineering worked in some cases? Because people have gotten together and designed some new systems that need to be implemented. But they haven't fallen through. They haven't taken action. They haven't retrained people. They haven't reassured people that, hey, this will work out. You know, trust me. Go for it. Follow through. So many times organizations have come up with a good reengineering plan, but they never implement it out of fear of the unknown, out of fear of loss. People in the organization maybe have secondary gain. They're afraid, well, if we reengineer, what will that do to my job? What will that do to my sense of control? We have to let go of that because otherwise these organizations won't be around to be able to provide those kinds of jobs for people. The truth of the matter is sometimes organizations have even implemented these changes, but they still aren't succeeding. Because I think the first step to regeneration, step number one, is you must reinvent yourself. 
whether it be you that you're trying to regenerate, like let's say you want to regenerate your own body and look and feel better and have a new identity, whether it be government wanting to reinvent itself, or whether it be a corporation. We have to develop an identity. Now, you remember what the process of identity really means. It means that if I think you're a great guy and you're my best friend and you treat me really vicious, I may get upset about that. But sure enough, after a while, I'll rationalize it and say, well, you're probably having a, what, bad day. But if I think you're a manipulator, if I think you're a liar, if I think you don't care about me or anybody else, and one day you start treating me really nice, I'm going to say in my head, what does he want? You see, what controls my responsiveness to you is not the fact that you re-engineered your life to be a nice guy now. <laughs> what controls it is my concept of you. A classic example is government. Government wants to reinvent itself by doing a better job. Well, if they go out and re-engineer like crazy, but as long as we think of government as a bunch of fat cats who are wasting our money, unless we create a new identity for government, we'll keep noticing what they don't do well, and they'll never change their identity, and the re-engineering process really won't last. There'll be no reinforcement for it. Do you follow me on this? The point of the matter is let me now briefly share with you the five fundamental processes for tapping into your resources, using those resources that right now are dormant in a brand new way that turn problems into assets, that turn waste into assets that dramatically improve the quality of life for your business and for your personal life, what we call regeneration. Here it is very briefly. Step number one, I've already told you, is reinventing. Now, what does it mean to reinvent? What really this first step of reinventing is, is number one, you've got to get a vision. The vision of what do you want things to be like. Number two, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make sure you flat decide or you're not going to turn back that this is how it's going to be. And number three, you've got to communicate, not only to yourself, but other people you're interacting with, that this is what you're committed to. Let's say, for example, you want to regenerate your body as a metaphor. You have to decide, what do I want to look like? Get images. Take a good look at what you look like now, so you get the motivation to change, and a good look at what your health level is like now, and then see what you want to look like. Design it in detail. Get clear about how you would function, what you'd be like, what your rules would be, how you'd conduct yourself. Then step two is, you've got to re-engineer your life so you really get that. That means you're going to have to work on, if you prepare your own food, making sure you make different purchases, or you hire someone else to prepare your meals. It means that you're going to have to say, okay, in the mornings, I'm going to exercise now, which means I'm going to go to bed earlier and get up earlier, and I'm going to do this so I get addicted to it. I'm going to get a coach, somebody who can help me to invent myself, someone who can help me to re-engineer my life and really make sure I follow through. Step three of regeneration is you've got to reassure the people involved. Now, if you're trying to regenerate yourself, you're going to need some reassurance because in the beginning, you're going to go out and it's going to be hard. That's where a coach can be so valuable because they reassure you, hey, it's going to be worth it. You're going to make it through. Hang in there. Same thing is true in a company. When we start making changes, people get fearful. They need to have a sense that, hey, this is really going to work. Reassuring just means that in the initial and in the ongoing process of constantly dispelling people's doubts, making certain that they feel like change is going to be safe, secure, but most important, it's going to be worth it. People have to be reassured to stay on board, and the same thing is true if you want to regenerate your life. The fourth element of regeneration is you've got to retrain. That is, in the case of your body, you've got to retrain muscles. You've got to teach them how to function differently. In the organization, you've got to retrain people on how to do things more efficiently. Because if you re-engineer everything, and you've got this brand new identity, and you've reassured everybody, but their old habits of doing things... Their old training, their old conditioning will keep them from doing things that will make the company profitable or make the job more efficient or make the family happier or whatever the case may be of what you're trying to regenerate. And finally, you've got to revitalize your life, your organization, your community, your family. And the way you do that is very simple. You take immediate action on this reinvention, this reengineering, this reassuring, and this retraining. You take immediate action on your plan. There's an old phrase I remember from years ago that's affected my life greatly, and it's one of the reasons I've achieved a lot of goals that many people have never even begun, and that is you never leave the site of setting a goal without doing something towards its attainment. You've got to take some kind of action. Revitalization occurs in an organization when people see it's not just the newest fad, that these things are actually happening. Changes are occurring. The secret is you've got to notice promote and publicize the small successes so they can stack upon one another and create momentum. Again, if it's your own body, you've got to notice those improvements. You've got to say, wow, i got some muscle here. I didn't have any before. Wow, I feel a little more energy here. Wow, I feel more flexible. Wow, I feel stronger. You've got to notice it and reward yourself with the acknowledgement that says, I'm making progress. Pretty soon, one success builds another until you have a brand new set of habits 
that are self-fulfilling, where there's an ongoing reward. The reward may be feedback from the outside of what people say to you about what they see and what they feel. The rewards are also from the inside, how you feel about your life and about your identity and about taking control of your own physical destiny. So now, having given you the overview of these five steps to regeneration, again, they are reinvent, which basically means come up with a vision, come up with a decision, and communicate it. The second step, again, is to re-engineer, which is figure out how are you going to organize things so that you can consistently get this new identity. The third step is to reassure, so you keep the certainty that will get you to take action and to follow through or get others to work with you to create this immediate, dramatic, and lasting change that you're committed to. Fourthly, you've got to retrain. That's really the process of giving people the special instruction or getting the coaching you need or the practice in that's necessary for you to achieve maximum efficiency in getting the job done, whether that job is enjoying your life or that job is being more effective and serving your customer. You've got to train yourself for maximum efficiency. You've got to get the special instruction or training, or you've got to give that to the people with whom you're committed to creating a regeneration and then revitalizing, which is really to give a new vigor a compelling future, something that really gets people excited and makes them implement this revitalization that you're so committed to. And that's created by giving them a compelling future, something people get excited about, and again, noticing the wins along the way and reinforcing them. And you know what? No matter how successful your life is, no matter how much you've accomplished, if you're not experiencing all the joy and passion that you want, then maybe it's time to do some regeneration. Maybe it's time to make some decisions about what you want your life to be like again. Maybe it's time to re-engineer it. Look at how you've organized your life and make sure you can get the same goals or maybe better goals with less stress. My point is real simple. No one is trapped in a box. No one has no choice except the person who believes it. Not living in the society that you and I live in. We have total freedom to create it any way we want it. Think about regeneration in a brand new way. Realize regeneration is a way you could contribute. You could figure a way to help regenerate your company. Wouldn't that be nice? Or maybe part of the process, the re-engineering at your company or the retraining. Maybe it can just be a source of reassuring people so people aren't so fearful about the future because you have a better understanding of where things are going and why the changes are occurring. Hopefully this tape is giving you some insight in that area. You don't have to do all of this. I just wanted this tape to provide you with a couple of things. One, an understanding of where some of the most important changes are happening within our society, where they're coming from, and where it's going to take us. An idea, too, of how can you take control of your own destiny? How can you turn around an organization, a community, a family, or your life? A way of looking at it, a frame of reference. Obviously, I haven't listed every single step in detail. That's part of your own creativity to figure out how to do it for you. There is no right or wrong way. You can get some coaching to assist you, or you can do it completely on your own. If there's one thing I want you to remember from this tape, it's to remember what human ingenuity, what your innate creativity can produce. I mean, just think about what you're capable of again, and instead of just thinking about it, do something. Think about what one human being can do through the power of vision, decision, communication, creative questioning, the reassurance that comes from conviction, the constant process of re-education and retraining, and the compelling future and the small successes that build to create the momentum of lasting change. Who we are and what we're capable of is so far beyond our present concept, it's a joke. Isn't it time you tapped into those dormant resources around you, whether it be the intellect of your friends, products or services that sit in front of you, or just your imagination? I shouldn't say just because maybe that's the greatest resource. To turn these dormant ideas, resources, elements into significant assets that massively improve the quality of your life and all those people you have the privilege to touch.